Hello everyone, next section. Let's talk about ways to represent functions. So function is not just an equation, okay? So uh, it can be it can be defined in uh, various ways. In this course, we will study four type of representation. They're not the only four, but they're most the most popular ones. Uh, the first one is numerical representation. So this is a function that we have that is given to us as a table of values. Uh, the second way is uh, second way is visual representation. This is when a function is defined by its graph. A third way, like the popular way here, I guess, uh, is the algebraic representation. So this is when the function is given to us through a formula. And then sometimes a function is just given to us using words or a description. This is what we will call like a verbal representation. So just a function that is defined with words. And then this section, this is the, the goal is to simply go through four examples, one of each kind. And these four uh, ways of representing a function is actually uh, very typical of what we do in science. Just, I like to go on a tangent here. Haha, <laughs> this is kind of a calculus joke. But when you have two quantities that you're trying to link together and you want to know like what is like the, 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 the internal behavior that links and connects the two. Normally what you do is you set up an, ex an experiment that will measure y as a function of x and you will get initially a numerical representation of your function. But then when you're studying that data, you wonder, hmm, okay, we, if you just look at numbers, it's very difficult to extrapolate some sort of behavior. So thanks to the Cartesian plane, if you put the data on, on the Cartesian plane, then you're going to construct a visual representation for for your function and get a graph. And then from the graph, depending on the shape of the graph, is it a line? Does it look like a quadratic? Does it have a period? And maybe like one of the trig function would do it, or does it grow very fast, like an exponential function? And then you can hope to get your maybe algebraic representation that will go through your data that is visually represented. And then once you have your formula, uh, if you see that your data is following like uh, the trend of a, of a, of a quadratic, you can say that all oh, y is proportional to the square of, you know, x. So you get your, your verbal representation and you have your law. And this is kind of strange because sometimes in science, when you learn shit, we typically teach you things like in reverse. We give you the law and then we look at the formulas behind the law and then we look at the graph and then we might throw you in a lab and measure some shit that you already understood very well. But we teach you the reverse way that things are typically done in science. Anyways, let's go and look at our first example. All right, first example, an example of a function that is defined by a table. So a numerical example. So here we go. Suppose I have 12 cats and four plastic bags. Suppose I am standing near a brick wall and I want to find the function f that computes the number of throws on the brick wall necessary to kill x cats in a plastic bag. I collect the following uh, data. So for one cat, if I put one cat in the bag, I need two throws in order to kill it. If I have two cats in the bag, you could assume that it's four, but when you have two cats, what happens is that the second cat sometimes uh, there's this hair back effect where like the other cats, if you, if, if the other cats collide on a cat before colliding on the wall, it kind of survives. So you actually need four, you need, I need five throws to kill two cats. If I have four cats in the bag, then I need 11 throws. And if I put five cats in a bag, I need 18 throws. This is the data that I collect. And as you can see, one plus two, one plus two, one plus two plus four plus five, that's my 12. That's my 12 cats, so I cannot continue with this experimentation. And of course, I have only four rows because every time I use a new plastic bag, so um, I, I'm not that cruel. Like I need a clean bag every time I start again. So this is the data. And if we're asking you, okay, now we want to know, okay, for, like for example, like for three cats, how much, how many throws would you need? Well, it's probably something between five and 11. Of course, we don't have that data now. So if we're asking you for the domain and the function is defined numerically, the only thing I'm expecting you to do is to give the X column. So here, boom, you're like one, two, four, five. That's my X. 
those are my my values in my x column so that's my domain so if i use the correct notation here so that's the domain of f uh, so that's for the domain here and then for the range i just want you to use the y column so if you look at the y values the number of throws um, well bang here 2 5 11 and 18 that's the number of throws that you need so those are the y value of course there's probably more values in this like for three there is a y value that we don't have for six there's a y value that we don't have but if we're just giving you the table the only thing we're expecting you to do is to uh, give us the y column and that's really it for domain and range for numerical representation again here the true domain for this question you could argue well maybe it's the whole real numbers you know because you could have like six seven eight cats etc but maybe there's a maximum of cats you can put per bag so maybe the domain is like from one to a finite number and the range, of course, would just adjust itself depending on the domain. It's clearly a subset of natural numbers. We're using all cats here. So just a, just a small remark here. Uh, it's not really related to, um, uh, to the rest. I have some special thanks uh, to make. So I would like to thank uh, Sabrina, the very nice cat here. Um, I would also like to take uh, time to mention uh, Floss. Floss was a very nice cat too. Uh, also Ventress, very fierce cat. Had a lot of hard time putting that one in a bag. Um, uh, I had also Greedy. I agree it was a bit easier because I just promised him some money. Uh, I also have a cat named Bob uh, that was of course modeled after me. Uh, I would I would also like to thank Coolio. Uh, always ready to go outside on a sunny day. Also zero, zero was probably one of the easiest one uh, to seduce. He was really ready to go in a bag, poor guy. Um, also chatty, always on chat room and you know, like on Facebook, making comments against Trump and stuff. He was really cool. Uh, also, I would like to take um, special mention to uh, my, 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 one of my favorite, uh, Snoke. Snokey, he's always Michelle, but he's, uh, he, he's a good cat though. And then, the three nameless cats, uh, they don't have names, but uh, the only thing I can tell you is that they're really good DJs. Okay, so anyways, all 12 of them, great troopers, thank you. Okay, you make science great again. Next example, an example of a function that is defined by its graph, so a visual example. So let f of x be defined by the graph below. So we have this graph here that uh, that starts at minus three, is zero until minus one, goes up in a, on a straight line of slope one uh, until zero, but at zero it jumps to two, and then it goes down from one with a slope of minus one all the way down to one, and then at one it jumps to one, the height one, and then it stays at one all the way uh, to four. And the first thing we want to check, and I want to do with you guys, is just to go over um, how do you evaluate a function using its graph. Like for example, if we're computing the output at minus four for that function, well, we can see that there's no part of the graph above or below minus four. So that function is actually undefined. Uh, at minus four, there's no output. But if we look at minus three, at minus three, there is a dot. So at minus three here, there is a dot and the height of the dot is zero. So the y value is zero. So the output is zero at minus one. So when x is minus one, we also have a dot. The dot is here. We have a part of the graph and the height of the graph at minus one is also zero. So we get zero for the output. Uh, what about minus 0 0.5 at minus 0 0.5? I get the, a part of the graph that is at this height at 0 0.5. So at minus 0 0.5, the function is 0 0.5 at 0. Um, so at x equals 0, the function, the height of the function is this black dot here. The height of that black dot is 2. So the output is 2. At 1, uh, at 1 here, 
the height of the graph is this black dot, not the white dot above it, so that's a hollow dot, and the height of the dot at x equal 1 is 0, and finally at 4, um, my function, the height of my function is 1, so the output is 1. So I'm expecting you to be able to compute outputs, so compute y values by uh, as a function of x values. So now what about the real deal here? What is the domain? So here, uh, so here, boom, okay, you can see that the graph is starting at minus 3 and ends at 4. So the domain for that function, so the domain for that function is the following. So domain of f is, so it starts at minus 3, so square brackets facing it, but it includes minus 3 and goes all the way up to 4, including it. So that's the domain for my uh, function. What about the uh, the range or the image of that function? So now I'm just going to kind of scan this graph uh, vertically. So here, uh, if I go and I look at it, I see that it starts at zero. If I scan it, it goes all the way up to one, then it jumps to two. So here, poof, like I can see, that's the range I'm using green here, like just to label vertically the range of that function. So here the range of that function, so if I'm using here uh, the same terminology as earlier, so the range of f, so range f, so the smallest possible output is 0, it goes all the way up to 1, then there's nothing between 1 and 2, but there is an output where the height is 2, so that's actually for x equal to 0. So look at the notation here. So this is a good occasion here to learn notation. So when you're talking about values in between, you're using interval notation. If you are just giving a bunch of uh, values that are single, uh, like in this case, I just want to say zero, all the numbers between 0 and 1. So that's an interval. But then I want to say it's also including 2. So 2 in the big U here it simply means union. This is how you, call, uh, you glue together a bunch of different intervals or different, a bunch of different sets. All right, that's it for that example. All right, next one, an example of a function that is defined by an equation. So an algebraic, you know, example. So now here we have f of x is equal to minus 2x squared plus 4x plus 3. So right away you should see that, oh, this is a good old quadratic equation. Normally when you have a quadratic equation and you're studying the domain and the range, the first thing you look at is the a value. So here the a value is minus 2. It is strictly less than 0. And because it is strictly less than 0, I know my function is going to be concave down. So this means that my, my, my range will start, you know, like, uh, we'll, we'll go down as low as we want. So all the way down to minus infinity, but we're going to have like a, a maximum. So to find a range for a quadratic equation, we need to find the vertex. So I'm going to do this by completing the square. So the way it works with completing the square, the first thing you do is you factor the a value out of the first two terms. So I'm factoring the a, which is minus 2, out of minus 2x squared, leaving x squared behind. And if you factor minus 2 out of 4x, you're going to be left with minus 2x. And then you leave the c outside. So that's the first step. And then part of the completion of the square is you always divide by 2. So it's always 2, like for every single example. The second coefficient, so if you take minus 2 and you divide it by 2, you're going to get minus 1. So when you get that minus 1, you know that x squared minus 2x can be written as x squared, x, sorry, x, x minus 1 squared. But you know that the minus 1 here, when you're going to square it, will produce a plus 1. So you need, in order to cancel that plus 1, you need to make sure that you subtract by minus 1 here so that this full bracket here is the same as x squared minus 2x. So it's the exact same expression. And now the only thing you have to do is distribute the minus 2 inside. So you multiply by minus 2 inside that bracket. Uh, so what you're going to get, of course, is minus 2 in front of the, that perfect square, the x minus 1 squared, and then the minus 1 times minus 2 becomes plus 2, and then you go plus 3, and you get your plus 5. And now what's kind of cool with the square completed here is that um, the, um, the, uh, the, values, the value at the end, the plus 5, is the y value of your vertex, 
and the minus one here, it's at the x minus h. So for the minus one here, uh, if you just take the one part, because your x value is always going to be minus h, so h is the coordinate of your vertex. So you have one here. So this means that one five are the coordinates of my vertex. So I know where the vertex of this quadratic is. I know it's concave down. So just by drawing the vertex at one five and knowing that it's a parabola that is open downward, I can see now that the range is from minus infinity all the way up to its maximum, which is five. And for quadratic, of course, the domain is always everything. So quadratics, there's no division by zero. There's no square rooting. There's no logarithmic term. So now if you're, so if you're computing the domain, I'm trying to stay consistent here with my coloring. So the domain of a quadratic equation is from minus infinity to infinity. So it's defined everywhere. That's just another way to write R here. And for the range, once I have my graph here, uh, for the range, so the range of that function, uh, well, it starts in hell and it rises all the way up to its maximum, its global maximum, which is five. Okay, so notice here, just in case you're not familiar with that notation, that when I use, when I look at intervals, I always use square brackets, either facing in when it's included or facing out when it's, when it's excluded. And for infinities, it's always going to be excluded. Now, one last example for my fourth way, a verbal representation. So a nice example, very simple to define, but there's no algebraic ways to um, to define this. So let f be the function that assign one if the input is a rational number, so a fraction, and zero if the input is irrational. So here, just to, to make sure we understand what type of function we're dealing with, I made a little table of this compute outputs for some inputs. So for example, if the input is zero, zero is an example of a fraction. So zero would spit out a one. So f of zero is one minus one over 17. That's another fraction. So f of minus one over 17 is one square root of two is a number that we know to be irrational. So the output is zero pi f of pi will be zero because pi is irrational. E, e is the uh, Euler number. Okay. So 2.718, etc. That's another irrational number. So f of e would be zero. What about root two to the power two log two base three? <laughs> this is just a, a way, an annoying way to say nine here. So uh, nine is a fraction. So uh, f of that, f of nine is just one. So what's the domain here? So every number, every real number is either uh, rational or irrational. So the domain for that function is everything. So from minus infinity to infinity, we can we can uh, compute outputs for every real number, but then the range for that function, well, it's a binary function in the sense that it only produces zeros or ones. So here it's just a set with two numbers in it. So it's zero or one, and that's the range for my function. And again, here, very simple example, like fairly easy to define, but there's no equation for it. You cannot really graph it. It would be very messy to graph. Um, Yes, I have a table of output, but obviously I can do this for every single number, even if it's a tedious task. So that's a nice example of a function that is defined using words. So no equations behind it. So for popular way to define functions, uh, numerical, so a table of data. Okay. So an X and a Y column or rows, depending on how it's presented, just make sure you're aware of what's going on. Uh, you could have like a function that is defined visually through its graph. And we'll spend a lot of time looking at graphs of functions to better understand them. Of course, functions defined algebraically, this will be like probably 90% of the time we'll be looking at functions that are defined algebraically and study them using our tools. And then some functions are just defined using, uh, using words. So verbally or description. There's more ways to represent functions, but those are the most popular ones, the ones that are going to interest us. But in particular, graphs and, and, and formulas will be our number, will be our priority in this class. Anyways, that's it. Bye-bye.